As the year 2015 draws closer, the World Health Organization believes the world is within reach of its targets of providing antiretroviral therapy to 15 million people. Reports show that there's been progress in every region, including in Africa, which has been lagging behind. This is in part due to a better continental response and the drastic reduction in the price of ARVs. The epidemic has impacted so many people in every region of the world. According to the World Health Organization, in 2002, 3 million people died from the disease. That's over 8,000 people a day. Africa is referred to as the epicenter of the disease. It is home to 75% of all people living with HIV. This epidemic has been with us for quite a number of years. In fact, we are in the, right in the third uh, you know, decade of this epidemic. So the impact has been uh, quite significant. It has been felt in, in all sorts of ways, uh, particularly in the economic sector in terms of productivity, but also at, at, at community and family level because uh, the impact uh, which comes from people who lose their work because they're not able to go to work, uh, it has an impact on their own livelihood, on their families, on the communities that they, they, they you know, they provide for. However, Africa has seen a decline in AIDS-related mortality rates in recent years. African countries have partnered to address HIV AIDS and improve the health of Africans. More than 6 million people received antiretroviral therapy in 2012 alone. This according to UNAIDS. Well, I, I think the, the statistic is as follows. Um, there's, there's around 25 million HIV-infected Africans sub-Saharan Africa that is, and, and around 38 million globally. So you can see most of the infected populations reside in sub-Saharan Africa. So when you've got that type of statistic, and of course not everybody is eligible for treatment, you know, but obviously the longer people live with ARVs, the more you start seeing more and more people coming into the system. So right now, in, in terms of the 25 million in Africa that require treatment, uh, sorry, that are infected, around 10 million or so require treatment. And we're treating about 6.5 million of those 10 million. The African focus is now on manufacturing ARVs on the continent, as leaders seek to move away from a dependency on external sources for life-saving medicines. When you're in a situation like we are here in South Africa where um, you've got the worst disease, the, the worst HIV AIDS disease burden of, of any country. Um, so something like uh, we represent 0.5% of the world's population, but we harbour 18% of, of, of the world's HIV prevalence. When you've got that type of statistic, it's, it's crucial that you start establishing local manufacturing capacity and capability. With all the progress made to help save the lives, there's been a positive impact in the supply of labour. That today we have been seeing quite some significant uh, changes in the, in the way in which uh, you know, the continent and countries have responded to the AIDS epidemic, where we have seen progress both in terms of uh, lowering the number of new infections, putting more people on treatment, which means that uh, people are going back to work, they are living productive life, they are able to provide for their families. Improved access to ARVs has helped prevent many children from being infected during the course of or after birth. The World Health Organization has it that mother-to-child transmission rates declined, overall from an estimated 26% in 2009 to 17% in 2012. There's a, a target that we are likely to meet by 2015 is the, the target of reducing uh, new infections from mothers to, uh, to babies. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, the, the, the 21 or 22 high burden countries, uh, in fact, most of them are making enormous progress in actually uh, reducing uh, transmission of, of the virus to the mother. So, so we still have uh, babies born with HIV, and uh, I, th I think the moral imperative is that really there should be no baby born with HIV in this day and age, because if you look at uh, America and Europe, there are no babies that are born in, uh, with HIV today. Uh, we have the technology. We ha we have the you know the you know you know the the, the, the science uh, that we can deploy to make sure that in fact no no babies are born with HIV. HIV AIDS has had a damaging impact on the continent, but the combined African effort is reducing the social and economic impacts of the epidemic. Pilani Nyalunga, 
CNBC Africa, Johannesburg. Joining me now in the studio to take a closer look uh, at the impact of HIV AIDS in Africa is Alex Van der Hever, independent health economist, Dr. Nolutando Nematswarani, the Discovery Health Clinical Specialist, and Dr. Don Pupuma, a family physician. Welcome all to the desk and thank you uh, so much for making the time uh, to join us. Perhaps, uh, Nolutando, let me come to you first. I mean, we heard the stats uh, in that package. Uh, 25 million people living uh, with the disease in Africa, representing over 69% of the overall infection population do we have anything to celebrate in terms of progress made thus far when the numbers are still so high I think we need to celebrate lives people have been living positively with HIV S yes we do still have some challenges that we need to address but uh, there is a lot that has happened so we are seeing reduction for example in prevention in the mother to child transmission rates we are seeing more and more people who are accessing treatment living for longer so the life expectancy has improved and we see that people are going back to work mm -hmm. and they are contributing to the economy of the country so there is still a lot to celebrate even though we're not going to ignore our challenges in mm -hmm. terms of making sure that we close the tap and prevent further infections and of course uh, one would assume that one of those key challenges of course is the infection rate and let me come to you Don with this and maybe let's unpack uh, that particular element who is getting inv infected what is the profile of this person uh, that we find in Africa is still the most vulnerable to being infected uh, the most vulnerable individual in Africa <coughs> remains what we call mobile males with money and that is because they are able to purchase sex in certain instances, they are mobile, they aren't at home, and therefore they are, tend to uh, get other partners, and to a certain extent they're marginalized and aren't able to interact with family and uh, they remain vulnerable because of that factor. Of course, uh, bringing you in, Alex, there's always the economic impact uh, of, the, of the disease uh, on, on the general economy. Today we had South Africa's GDP's number coming out for the third quarter, 0.7%, very low. What is your views in terms of the impact of uh, productivity uh, that, uh, that we see in the economy on the back of such a disease? There have been many arguments suggesting that there is a very substantial impact. The, the real truth is that the impact is actually quite minimal right. on economic growth. And in some cases it's been overstated for a number of reasons. But the, uh, the impact is on the capability of certain groups of people to develop because it actually hits the most vulnerable groups of people more than the less vulnerable, more than the uh, better educated and the people more likely to gain, get employment. So you've got a protected part of the economy which continues regardless. Mm. And for the rest, the, uh, the issue is how fast are they developing and getting into the modern economy. And that's the group that's being uh, affected. Let's look at that group in a little bit more depth, Alex. I mean, would, we, would it be uh, right to make the conclusion that where there is uh, uh, vast amounts of poverty that uh, infection rates are likely to be highest in those pockets as well? Well, it, it wouldn't necessarily be only poverty that's the, that's the cause because, for instance, uh, transactional sex, for instance, is an issue. And that means where you've got a disparity in incomes, for instance, between males and females in particular areas. So low educational levels mm. for females will actually generate a greater degree of vulnerability to, um, to, to, that, f uh, uh, to that particular uh, uh, context. Uh, so that's, that's an area that, that um, it's not the poverty alone that's causing it, it's in fact the disparity. Right, so we see where we're seeing inequality and disparity, infection rates are likely higher. But perhaps, uh, Nultano, let me come back to you and look at how businesses have responded to having a, a workforce that uh, has a, a higher than before number of infected personnel. Have businesses responded in a way that is enabling uh, in terms of working and uh, to getting those numbers down? Definitely, I think business has responded positively in the sense that, I mean, the testing campaigns that happen within mm -hmm. the workplace where businesses are encouraging their employees to actually know their status because the start of it is really by knowing your status so that you can access healthcare earlier on. And also it's about saying once you know your status, if you're negative, how do you live? you know, continue to live a, a negative life so that you, you don't contract HIV. So how do you prevent yourself from contracting HIV? So I think most of the companies have got workplace programs that actually assist their employees uh, to, to, to do the testing. If they do require medication, also transition them to care specifically 
uh, we're looking at employees who are currently under medical insurance, like mm. for example, people who belong to Discovery, to actually get into disease management, disease management programs where they will access benefits that will en enable them to live longer and more productive lives. Again, I think we're speaking about a very uh, you know, small part of uh, the, the broader population. And, and Don, I, I want us to perhaps uh, take this conversation to the South African that's probably not working for Discovery, is not part of any uh, uh, medical aid scheme. Let's talk about their drive to want to know their status. Are we finding that the campaigns that are being rolled out on the ground, and even if we look at this from a South African context, are actually hitting home and people are walking into the practice and saying I'd like to get tested. The campaigns are being effective and uh, I think you, you make a profound point when you speak about which uh, particular groups are particularly vulnerable and it's people who are in the labor intensive sectors so for mm. example transportation, mining, construction and all of those kind of areas where they typically wouldn't be able to access uh, discovery health medical aid and that per particular uh, support. But um, the workplace and the campaigns that have been launched by government and by private companies have been pretty effective in the sense that a lot of those people are beginning to access A, treatment, B, um, testing, and uh, beginning to definitely live, live longer lives and be productive and remain as part of the labor force, which is what we as a continent desperately need. Yeah, I would a lot of employers are focused only on employees mm. and not their families and uh, well that in some cases they're avoiding that particular risk for the company focusing on really what's important to them and but they're not solving a social problem so the government services are remain pretty important within mm -hmm. that but also to the extent that an employer is actually trying to provide some form of care the question is can you really provide genuine care if you're only treating half the family so that is a question where we leave it for the first half. Can you really provide genuine care if you're only focusing on your particular employee? We're going to take a short ad break now, but more on the epidemic when we return. See you in two minutes. Welcome back to Invest Africa. Remember, we value your suggestions and feedback, so please send us an email to investafrica at abn360.com or interact with us on Twitter through at CNBC Africa, hashtag Invest Africa, or follow me at Nozi Pombanja. Still with me, I have my guest, Alex van der Heer, here by Independent Health Economist, Dr. Nol Tando Nematwirani, the Discovery Health Clinical Specialist, and Dr. Don Pupuma, a family physician. So now, during the break, we had a little bit of a tete a tete. No, Nol Tando, you're very eager to bring in the 16 days of activism and how that uh, you know creates greater awareness um, let me allow you to do that before I, I respond with my own views on that I think it's more about saying uh, women and children still remain vulnerable in terms of the fact that we've got a very high rape uh, incidence uh, in South Africa so that actually exposes the women and the and the and the children to HIV I, I guess my response uh, was that I would really appreciate it if we had just more than a short period or a month dedicated uh, to such issues. And I, I sometimes feel that uh, having a minister pronounce something once uh, a month in a 12-month cycle is not as Im effective uh, in my view. But yes, I do agree with you. That's possibly uh, a very important uh, strand of the conversation that mm -hmm. we have to bring in. You know, mm -hmm. I, I also want to weave a little bit. And I want to mm -hmm. go back to a point that Don made about um, the, the, you know, the labor force uh, the people that are outside of the labor force. And I want to bring that back to you, Alex. I want us to talk about uh, the labor intensive industries. When an investor is looking at a, a particular African country, um, how strong a an indicator, how significant an indicator is the prevalence of HIV AIDS, uh, uh, especially if you're looking at a mining company or any other labor intensive company that wants to uh, bring some foreign direct investment? Well, I think the. Uh issue to understand that's important is that it is not that that the, the sort of the business side of investment is not necessarily impacted on negatively mm. um, there has been an excessive stress on the on the sort of the the business risk associated with HIV and there have been a number of studies on South Africa which I found very problematic I think that the the implications are very significant at a social level and in terms of longer-term development but in terms of immediate investment the risk is is low 
know. Mm. I think the important issue is not letting businesses get away with not helping people, not protecting them from HIV and protecting them when they're uh, and providing them with access to services and information. But that does not impose significant business risk mm. on anybody wishing to invest in South Africa. No, Tanda, how do you respond to that? And also in light of an earlier point uh, that Alex made that uh, taking care of the, the, the actual employer, not their broader family, isn't actually making the impact that's required? I think looking at it at, at from a discovery point of view, because remember, we service the whole family. So it will be employer. So there's an exception to the rule, yes. I guess. <laughs> yes, it will be the employee with the dependents. So right. you find that the spouse and the dependents, including the kiddies, are actually part of the, of the, of the whole program. So it's different for, for the uninsured where the person does not have access to medical aid and therefore it means the family is actually left so out. So I see Don has a comment, then we'll come back to you, Alex. I yes. think we shouldn't forget the role of the state in this. And mm. the state has been a big driver of mm. where we are and in terms of progress and in terms of uh, their targets for the country. And equally important, uh, I think it's important to note that business ultimately pays the bill for this via tax. Mm. And therefore, it isn't big business's interest to make sure that HIV is contained, mm. especially considering how much it costs uh, right through the value chain from testing through to lifelong treatment if someone slips through the cracks mm. and lands up with HIV. Mm. Yeah, the issue is that well, quite a lot of, there are a number of people on programs, employer related programs, which are not medical schemes. Mm. And uh, often, uh, essentially private short-term insurance arrangements or some other kind of contractual framework outside of the Medical Schemes Act. The uh, medical schemes are required to cover the whole family, but the employers, typically when they don't have to, don't. But, uh, and the insurance arrangements don't necessarily. So it is up to, uh, but the medical scheme is not allowed to deny access. Mm. So that's where there is a, a difference. So that burden is then placed, you know, shifted onto the state. And I think that the state has to carry a major burden um, yeah. of dealing with this. But I think that to the extent that employers only accept part of the obligation where they're dealing with their own employees, I think that that, that isn't right. But uh, government really is, is the major contributor to solving the problem at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I want to throw this back uh, to you, Don, on the point of government. I mean, we, a, a lot of the gains that have been made in South Africa and other African countries, uh, it's been said, has been on the back of PEPFAR and similar fundings from uh, international donors. And we know that that funding is not, it's not a bottomless pit. And at some point, uh, it, 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 will, it, it will be finished. Mm -hmm. Now, are we making the right decisions now from a policy perspective to ensure that should those funds and when those funds run out, that uh, governments can actually continue with these programs? I think we are. I think we're on track. Um, a lot of interventions and a lot of targets, um, starting with the National Strategic Plan, mm. which, for example, looks to halve the number of new infections that we uh, get. I mean, uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, over the past 10 years, we've been having approximately 400,000 new infections per annum. Uh, which is uh, way, way uh, too high. Mm. And government has set a target of having reducing that to at least half mm. by 2015. And the cost of that uh, for the 2013-2014 uh, budget is approximately 23 billion rand. And going into 20, uh, 2014 into 2015, mm. we're looking at about 35 billion rand. That is a huge sum of money to expend on but one. But then again, there's that shortfall uh, yeah. that's been identified, uh, and I, I think I've picked up those figures as well. And the shortfall has been against those figures about three to five billion rand um, U.S. dollars uh, of a shortfall. Where's that money going to come from? Um, that, that's where. <laughs> <laughs> that's the golden question. Maybe mm. Alex, do you have some idea of where they can get the money from? Well, uh, uh, the, the, the issue is that this is a question that always faces the country. To the extent that we've relied on a form of aid for an aspect of our recurrent funding mm -hmm. for, uh, for HIV and AIDS, uh, we, we have to look at long-term solutions because it's not sustainable, to ex it's not appropriate to expect mm. that to continue. 
Um, what we need to do, therefore, is to look at not only the, the issue of the effectiveness of the programs today in reducing the long-term liability, which we haven't done, which is bringing down the infection rates properly. In other words, that the programs actually work. Right. There's a lot of stuff happening, but it doesn't necessarily translate into stuff that makes a difference. It's just shooting in the dark. And then, <coughs> then there is the issue of bringing down the cost of tests and bringing mm. down the cost of drugs, mm. as well as the overall economic, macroeconomic impact of the drugs programs, which means that we reduce the amount that we're importing on mm. this, because we've got such a large liability. We shouldn't be importing it. We should be domestically producing it. Mm. Plus the the actual, the, the kind of um, uh, risk reduction programs that do have a long-term impact like vaccines need to be looked at because even if they only come in mm. 10 years from now, they, they have a chance of having both a therapeutic effect as well as a, uh, a, a reduction in transmission. And if that happens, we're actually substantially changing the liability. Right, it's bringing you back in, Don. Um, there are a number of exciting developments and uh, I think it's important for us to perhaps even dwell on them. The most important being uh, the recent adoption of voluntary medical male circumcision mm. and what it can do to the pandemic. Um, and as part of a bigger strategy, which we call combination uh, prevention strategy, whereby we include the uh, uh, psychosocial aspect, uh, which includes education, et cetera, et cetera, and the biomedical aspect, which includes treatment. Uh, and in this instance, one of the more recent appreciations is that treatment is not merely treatment uh, in terms of sustaining life, right. but now treatment has become a major source of uh, preventing new infections. And when we have combination prevention strategies like circumcision of mm -hmm. uh, uh, mobile males and just males in general, uh, that should have a, 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 a long lasting impact on the pandemic. Let me bring you, I, I want to bring you in then, Old Sandra, and perhaps before you, you respond uh, to Don, to perhaps also talk to us a little bit about the, the changing demographics on the continent where we're moving to a much, uh, much younger uh, population and how that might mean that we need to rethink the way we message uh, our campaigns in terms of reducing HIV and AIDS. The way we're doing things right now, is it still going to be relevant uh, 10, 20 years from now when 65% or more of the population is all under the age of 20? Sure. Um, I mean, you, you're looking at people who are getting new infections, the younger population. I mean, in my view, the younger population is aware of HIV. So they are taking precautions and you can see there is a reduction in new infections in the younger age group. But we still have in the reproductive age group some new infections coming through. So I think in terms of uh, changing the strategies, yes, we need to, to start um, looking at HIV differently. But I think the messages have gone through and people are starting to understand in terms of prevention. But I think prevention also is a bit complex in the sense that not one single strategy can actually reduce the infections. Mm, so you need to really have a comprehensive package of these uh, prevention strategies, which is something that I think all the countries are grappling with. And in South Africa, we are also focusing at looking at male medical uh, circumcision uh, looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis and I think the most important one that uh, has been uh, uh, included in the guidelines is really about prevention of, 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 of transmission between serotiscoidant couples where you've got a positive and a negative uh, partner right. that are in a long-term relationship to say give access to medication so that you can actually prevent the negative partner in that long-term relationship from actually contracting HIV. Our final comments uh, to, to wrap this up. Uh, Alex, if you could just comment for us on uh, the role of civil society and particularly NGOs in driving uh, for this agenda. We've seen you know, the treatment action campaign getting a lot of prominence, but surely uh, there's still scope to do more in terms of giving them the capacity and the space to, to play a bigger role. Well, I think civil society has been absolutely critical in getting uh, our programs to where it is today. We, we had a, um, a, a government that wasn't moving adequately on both prevention and treatment. And where we are today is, is to a large extent, a consequence of non-governmental action. They are a crucial part, and I think that they have to remain. It, it essentially, people have to grab that space. It's not one that's given to them. They've got to take it. And, I've got uh, less than a minute. Point. 10 seconds, Noel Tandok. You know, if for, from you, if we look at uh, the MDGs, 2015 is around the corner. What do you think that picture is going to look like? A good or positive picture? It will be a better picture, but maybe not where we're supposed to be. <laughs> a better picture. Final comments uh, from you, uh, Don. Uh, let's look at uh, the 
coordinating uh, the HIV AIDS response within the country, do you think that there's more that could be done in that space? There's always more that can be done. And uh, I'm thrilled to say that people interact, people are continuing to work together, and the government and civil society have begun to see the light and uh, realize the importance of having a, no new infections in about 20 years from now, if we act together in unison. Again, very robust debates uh, and very insightful discussions and just not enough time. We've come to the end of this week's edition of Invest Africa. Thanks to all my guests, Alex van der Heever, Independent Health Economist, Dr. Nol Tando Nemetsorani, Discovery Health Clinical Specialist, and Dr. Don Pupuma, a family physician. Until next time, it's goodbye and thank you for joining us.